We are in First uh, Thessalonians chapter four, and we're gonna we're we're also gonna be in uh, was it John? Is it John? Yeah, John a bit too uh, this morning. So as we uh, as we begin this morning, let's go ahead and read uh, this. Uh, it's really the second half of chapter four. I think I, I made note last week that second half to some degree owes its its kind of allegiance to chapter five, which we'll get into after next week, because next week we'll, of course, turn our attention to the resurrection. But uh, um, uh, this is, if, if, we, if we make mental notes, we'll want to make a mental note is, as we kind of walk through this morning, we don't want to miss that we pick up again in, uh, in chapter 5 in, in two weeks. So let's, uh, let's read the second half of chapter 4 in the first letter of Thessalonians. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of the men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you what we, who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. That's a tough sentence. I can't believe I actually got through that one. If you, if you read that one, that's a tough sentence to, to read. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel the, and the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Uh, as we begin, I'd, I'd like to just grab that last sentence, encourage each other with these words. I mean, that's Paul kind of concludes this particular thought, because he's this, this kind of whole passage is a thought. He kind of concludes this particular thought with this idea that this is to be told, retold, retold again. To, this is supposed to be something that we are encouraging each other with as, as we live our lives. Now, it, to some degree, that encouragement would be brother to brother, sister to sister, because when we speak of this, the expectation is brother to brother, sister to sister. We understand what we're saying. We do. And that's where Paul begins. We tell you what we know. We understand this. And I, I again, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to, ins- I'm maybe not hesitant. I'm, I'm, I'm cautious about inserting words in scripture. I'm not hesitant to because I think sometimes it helps me and if it helps me, maybe it helps somebody else. But I'm cautious about it. But when he says that we tell you what we know, I'm going to suggest to you that this is our unalterable conviction. This is an absolute anchor in our lives and we're telling you this anchor that it becomes an anchor in your life. So if we if we take that idea from we tell you what we know and kind of in my opinion uh, to the best of my discernment elevate it to this is the unalterable anchor then I want you to encourage each other with this truth. And this truth of the second coming of Christ is a huge part of the hope that we have as Christians. It I mean I, I think Paul said if if I believe it's Paul who said this, is as if, if, if what we tell you is a lie, well, then there's no hope for anybody. <laughs> you know, that the, the, the truth that we offer you is characterized by your hope. Your, what you know is coming. So as we begin this, uh, just kind of grab that last, last piece for just a second and encourage you as you encourage me, as we encourage each other, that that second coming is coming. It's it's real. It's true. It's coming. This is not a not a not a story. Not a dream. Not a a, a, a tradition that we that we that we uh, carry. It is an absolute truth that has yet to be unfolded. And we'll, we're going to get a little bit of a hint from Paul uh, about that ever ready awareness of that. In this, in this passage, but we'll get there in a minute. So let's begin here. And uh, as we begin, um, Paul says, Brothers, I don't want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep and grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. So he makes a differentiation here that as you as Christians, as we've just said, have a hope. He's not told us what that hope is yet. I think principally they may have a bit of a handle on, on the hope. Um, uh, uh, he doesn't, or I mean, uh, he does, and I just wanted to check one thing here that I meant to check earlier this morning before I say it, because I think I'm right on this, but I just don't want to, I don't want to misspeak. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, this letter that Paul writes to the Thessalonians predates the Gospels. This comes before the Gospels were penned, and for that matter, before they were distributed. So um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what they pen and then starts to be distributed amongst the churches, that comes, at least by the accounting that I have, 20 plus years after this letter was written to the Thessalonians. Now, I'm gonna anachronistically make some links here uh, but this is this is really early. So I'm asking you this morning, as we look at both of the passages that we're going to be looking at this morning, to put your sandals on, get some some of your imagination juices flowing here for a minute, because I'm going to ask you to walk back and start looking through their eyes a little bit and listening with their ears, especially when we get because we're going to walk back to the Gospel of John for a few minutes this morning, but. When Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant like those, uh, about those who have fallen asleep, like those who have no hope. When he's talking about those who have no hope, those who don't know. I mean, uh, we've all been around long enough to have been to quite a few fu funerals. And some of those funerals we've been to are celebrations of life. Where all the goodness of, of the departed is what's put on stage. Others' funerals we've been to have been funerals where... Um, the, the vehicle of honoring the one who's passed before us is a vehicle to speak to those who are still here, to say the path this person walked is a path, the narrow path unto heaven, and that can be your path also. And a funeral becomes very evangelical, and we, we, we do honor the walk of this person's life but not for his, his or her accomplishments, but because of his or her faith. And if you go to the last uh, chapter of Hebrews, uh, Paul, whom I claim writes Hebrews, says that consider the way of life of those who came before you and imitate their faith. And it's a great passage because it links back to Hebrews 11, which we're not going to go to this morning. But he's saying that those who went before you don't look at anything at all about their lives expect, except their faith. If you want to imitate those fathers who came before you, those mothers who came before you, those who walked in faith, you know, look at their faith lives. That's what we should be illuminating at a funeral. And then we've been to other funerals, and, and this is where, where, where Paul references here. I've been to other funerals where, well, this is, this is it. There's nothing more. And the, 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 the uh, overwhelming tears of emotion, and then a lot of, and, and I mean, honestly, the ones that I've been to, there are, there are those, there's a, a certain crowd in every one of these funerals of the unredeemed where it's very dismissive. I'm showing up to pay my respects, and that's it. I'm not getting involved. This is, this, is, this, is, this is more than I can take on. This is more than I want to bear. I'm here to pay my respects, and I'm gone. And if you look around at the, at the, at the um, assembly at funerals like this, you can see those who are one, in despair for the lost, two, those who are mournful that this is it, that there's nothing more, and those that are totally detached as a, as a, as a, a, a mechanism of, of preservation for their own, quote, well-being. You know, that, that, those are hard. Paul's talking about the, the no-hope crowd here. Don't be like them. That, that would be reflective of your old way of life, but your new way of life this, this, this way of Christ is part and parcel to the hope that I'm talking about. And so when you see someone die, what I want you to think about is one who has fallen asleep. And the language here about those who have fallen asleep is met literally metaphor, literally metaphorical, that's a stupid thing to say, uh, is, is truly a metaphorical description of the body that is made to be finite as past, but the spirit the, uh, is, that is made to be eternal is very much alive. And since we live this side of heaven without the, the, the clarity of perception that God has, that Christ has, what we should see is not death. What we should see is a, a sleep 
to awaiting resurrection. Now what we will learn later from John in 1 John is to be absent with, from the body is to be present with the Lord. And to be absent from the body means there's something that is in the body that is no longer with the body. That's you. <laughs> you, you, are a, you are an eternal spirit that has a temporary body. You are not a body that has a spirit. You are a spirit that has a body. And that body is designed to go away. It's not going to, you're going to get a new one. But that's going away. And so when Paul says, when you see a dead person, don't see the hopeless loss. See one destined for the golden shores of heaven. One who has fallen asleep in this world only to open his eyes on the golden shores of heaven. That's what you should see. That, there should be no pain there. There should be great joy that someone made it home. Now, I don't want to make light of the, of the, of the loss of those whom we love. Uh, those who have gone on before us, the, their presence in our lives and, and their friendships and their familial bond, that's, that's valuable to us. But that's not over. The great, the, the, there's a great joy in this that, that we will sooner than we think be reunited and that that life is not gone, nothing. So we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And this is where I want to just kind of depart from Thessalonians, and I want to go to John for a minute. Again, if, 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 I can, if I'm allowed to include the word here, we believe we are, we are to the depths of our very existence convicted that Jesus died and rose again. And again, if we go to 1 John, we'll say that it's, we know uh, who our brothers are by those who uh, say he, I'm, I'm, I'm blowing this, I'm, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go there real quick. This is how we know we can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. That's, 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 John writing in his first letter, this is how we can recognize the Spirit of God. This is how we can recognize brothers and sisters. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Nobody was arguing that Jesus was born, uh, was, was born walked the streets of Jerusalem for 33 years. Nobody's arguing that, that he had lots to say. Some thought a prophet, some thought a madman, some thought, a lot thought everything in between. No, nobody's questioning whether or not the fleshly existence of the man named Jesus, son to Mary and Joseph, from Nazareth, walking the streets of Jerusalem, causing a big... Nobody's questioning that. The question is the resurrection of the flesh. That's the question. If you ask people about the question about whether or not Jesus lived, everybody's got a handle on that. If you ask a question about did Jesus rise in the flesh, that's where the debate is. Those who, this is how you know, that's the great link. Well, one of these days we actually are going to get to 1 John. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Those who recognize that Jesus arose from the dead. That's what he's talking about. So, we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we believe that God will bring, Jesus, uh, bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Fallen asleep in those who have passed before us. That they're going to come with him. Okay, so, yes, sir. I got a subject that I want to bring up that I'm struggling with for a long time. And it says that when Jesus comes back, the bodies that are buried will come out of the graves and be with him, right? What if somebody's cremated? What happens? I know God is capable of anything. He can take that dust and bring it the same, I would assume, maybe, but I don't know. I just thought I'd bring it up. And or buried at sea? Yeah. Or buried at sea. Huh? Yeah. Or uh, uh, eviscerated in a fire of uh, 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 a falling 110 story building? Yeah. Or any number of ways. I mean, it, it's, it's not just cremation. Cremation is a willful act, but there's lots of, and, 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 and a burial at sea is a willful act also, but there's lots of ways where the, the recognizable condition of the body that our, our morticians do so much work on to try to make us presentable in a casket, to, to look as closely alive and to sleep as possible, uh, uh, that didn't happen for a lot. A lot of, uh, a lot of people are cremated. Um, 
Uh, I struggle so, with it a little bit because I've had family members that yeah. cremated. Okay, so, so is the struggle, is the struggle, what does God say about that? What does God think about that? Is that is that something that a Christian should do? Is, or is it is it a problem? I mean, for who? For, for so Jesus we're, we're cutting to it. do that? It's a problem, a problem with me as far as how I feel about it. <clears throat> I don't think there's well, any... I think, go ahead. I think it says... That don't rise from the dead. So I think, you know, whether we're cremated or whatever, he's going to... The body will come yeah. together. Yeah. And then, I think so. Yeah. And then I've always wondered, I don't want to get too deep here, but what age are we going to be in heaven? Yeah. You know, you, you, well, I mean, you know, you, you hear of people saying, well, I saw my father and he was old, but then his body was, you know... I, I, those are just questions for Christ mm -hmm. as Jesus once we get up in there. But, you know, it's just hard to kind of think about that. You have a child that dies, an infant that dies, someone mm -hmm. dies at 90 years old. What will that body be like for someone that's crippled, without <laughs> arms or legs? I know. I, I it's up. just a lot to well, understand. I have a brother that was cremated, and what, what Keith is saying, I thought many times over and over again. Does the gospel say you will have a new body? Uh, yeah. We're getting there, yeah. The, I walk into this a couple of ways. A long time ago, um, I met with um, uh, a young man for, um, I don't know, six months or so in a kind of a, a morning study. And um, in our conversations, he had uh, indicated that he had most recently uncovered these porcelain elephants that uh, were made somewhere in the in the Far East. and, and and um, uh, in, uh, uh, he had taken just an extreme amount of joy because I think they were a gift from his mother, maybe, but a family member. And he just, he just, he just was just totally overjoyed with these uh, these elephants that that he had. And um, uh, as I thought about kind of, because that was a total distraction for the morning. He just he just couldn't get off these elephants. And as I as I thought about that, uh, it occurred to me that. Somewhere back a long time ago when the earth was formless and void and the earth was gathered together and separated the earth from the waters, buried somewhere in the earth was a, a, a mineral. And that mineral has aged throughout centuries and centuries and centuries until it was harvested by somebody in the Middle East, refined, brought to a manufacturer, manufacturer made those elephants, glazed them, put them in packages, shipped them to America. They were sold to a lady who kept them much of her life and then given to her son. And they sit on his shelf and he takes an extreme amount of joy out of those elephants. And I'm thinking, God knew that when the earth was formless and void. And that little piece of gypsum, or, or, or yeah, gypsum, he had carried all the way through all of that because he knew one day there'd be a guy who would take great joy in the seed that he planted in the formation of the earth. Now I'm going to suggest that it's a little bit like that. That when God scooped up the earth of this planet and formed man and breathed life into him, and from him took a rib and created that which would complete him to make them in his likeness and image. And the, the, the godly offspring that came all the way up to producing one of us, that now passes away. Regardless of whether or not I was cremated and I am but an urn of ashes, but the, the remains of me is but an urn of ashes, or I have been embalmed and in full body burial, slowly deteriorating, uh, either in a mausoleum or a grave, and without being too difficult, mausoleums have to have drainage channels in them because the decomposition of your body produces a lot of rancid fluid. And so what we think of is what we're looking at each other, that's not what's in that casket for very long. All of it, no matter how we go, when the, when the, when, when the life that God breathed into me has has been separated from me that is absent from the body such that that life me is present with the Lord that remains no matter how it goes goes returns literally as we say back to the dust from which it came 
And so putting that back together, raising that, I don't have a really great answer, but I have, as Paul says here, a great hope slash conviction that he who walks on water or created water can walk on it and turn it to wine, can part it and can collapse it. He can do the same thing with his body. And I, I, I'm, not, I'm not overly concerned about it. Whether or not it is permissible for, in God's eyes, for us to cremate or full body burial, to add preservatives or not add preservatives, whatever it is, I don't have a perfect answer for that, but I'm willing to say that it really doesn't make much difference that God puts us back together. And then, as, as uh, Larry just told us, it's not this anyhow. <laughs> It is a new imperishable body. This is perishable. This goes away. I'm reminded every morning that there's a little bit left, a little <laughs> less here now than there was the day before when I climb out of the bed with a little bit of an ache and a pain. <clears throat> you know, that This isn't going to last forever, but the new body does. And the new body, what age is it? What do we look like? I don't know. I know this is made for the physics of the planet on which we were given to live, created by God. But I don't, have, I don't know what the physics of heaven are. I know that transcends time. And for us to, to experience timelessness in this form is inconceivable, to the best of my understanding. So I don't, I don't have a perfect answer. I just know that from the dawn of time, God has preserved a place for me. He's preserved a place for you. And he has a, a new body that he's created for that eternal nature that he created in his likeness and image in you. And he will make that with you. And he will raise that. Well, that's what he talks about a reunion. We will be reunited with those who have died. How he puts them back together is his business. I'm looking forward to the reunion. <laughs> <laughs> And, and why are you looking forward to the reunion? Because I know those that have passed. Yeah, <laughs> I was just making it. Because there's always good food at a reunion. <laughs> yeah. There is a great banqueting feast of the Lamb. Uh, that, um, I have a, an opportunity from time to time to, to, to write a blessing letter to, to graduates. And, and I include in that a small passage I wrote many, many years ago about knowing that one day I'll be at that table and I'll see you, I have confidence I will see you across that table and I'll slip you a note that says, I knew you'd be here. The glorious meeting. Yeah, it will, because we will, we will know all of those who have come before us. Yeah, Jim? Yeah, I look at, at death as uh, a little different than most folks. I look at it as just an interruption. Yeah, That's all it is. It is. It's just an interruption. It's just, if, I, I'm, if you've got Jesus in your heart, in spirit, it's just an interruption. Right. You know, yeah, you miss people because of what we talk, talked about earlier about the friendships and the camaraderie and that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, it's, it's just an interruption. I always refer to it as life after life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's a, there, there, for, the, for those who have no hope that Paul's right here, it's um, uh, the only thing that follows uh, life is death. But what we know of is the only thing that follows death is eternal life. I'm walking dead man now. That, that's, that's, there, there's, there's, I mean, I, I shouldn't kid myself because I smile at myself in the mirror. I'm walking dead man now. There is, there is eternal life that follows this. Uh, I'm just trading in the old model for the new model. The introduction in the book likened it to a comma instead of a period. In other words, you have a sentence and you have a slight pause, uh -huh. a comma, and then you go on. Agreed. Agreed, agreed. Oh, in, in this book, okay. Because I, uh, I agree with you, but I was trying to, to link that to the introduction of this book or this letter, and I'm thinking, where did Paul say something like that? And I was, uh, yeah. so that, okay, yeah. So, no, okay, I, I, I spend very little time in the book, so I, I, I must have missed, uh, obviously I missed that. Okay, so, um, gosh, we've, we've, no, I'm sorry, I thought you No, that, that's okay, that's okay, that's okay. Okay, I know, I know, I know where we're at, okay. Yeah, okay, so we're, 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 honestly, we're where I want to be. So, this letter well predates the gospel. This is the, the anachronism here. This is, uh, this is where we're, we're going to pop back because you and I live. No, let me do it this way. Let me do it this way. Um, 
if you go to verse 17 real quick. We're, we're not skipping a whole lot here. We're just going to, I hadn't planned on doing this, but I'm going to do this this way. Uh, go to verse 17. After that, we who are still alive are, uh, are, and are left will be caught up together with them. Do you hear Paul say, after that, after the, the dead who arise in verse, then we who are still alive. Now, if Paul says we who are still alive, does he include Paul? Yeah, principally, the language would suggest that, that Paul's saying, you know, me and the rest of y'all that are still alive, you know. So you could read this to suggest that Paul has every expectation that the return of Christ is within his lifetime. Yeah, and he could, he could and, and, and that may be, I, don't know, I, I can't read Paul's mind all the way back then, that, that may be. And I, and I know that, that that particular sentence, along with a couple of other reference points, uh, are, are what some say that, oh, Christ is always coming. We're already living in this tribulation thing. That's what this is. Christ has already returned. If you're looking for the second coming of Christ, that's already happened a long time, time ago. Paul said so himself. It would happen within his lifetime. I don't know when it was. I don't know how it happened. Obviously, it wasn't recorded. But that, that, all, that all happened a long time ago. You're, you're living in some other uh, nature of existence that is pre-heaven, post-second uh, uh, coming. Now, I don't subscribe to that at all. But there are plenty who, plenty who do. It's a pretty aberrant form of, uh, of theology, but plenty who do. I want to suggest to you that it's possible that what Paul's describing is not necessarily a timing, but an attitude. Paul is ever present in his, every day of his life, looking forward to the return of Christ such that he could say, we who are still alive when he returns, to say, that's my hope. I'm not saying that that's the timing, I'm saying that's the hope. And the reason that the, 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 the attitude rather than the timing has value to me, because that's what he's passing on to the Thessalonians and what he's passing on to you and I. That every day of our lives, every day of my life, every day of your life should be lived in that same attitude that we who are still alive, will rise after those who have gone before us. That should be every single day of our life, living as though today is the day that the eastern sky will part and we will see him coming on the clouds as he said he would to take his possession. That should be our attitude, not our timing, but our attitude. So I'm willing to, to, to say that what Paul's talking about is the attitude that he's passed on to the Thessalonians and to us and that we should live under. That we shouldn't, we shouldn't be talking about, and I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm not going to, to run this down too far, but very quickly after that, the first sentence in chapter 5, now brothers, about the time and the dates we do not need to write you on, we're going to get into that uh, in two weeks. But that, that's part of what lends time and date, nah, not, not what you should be focused on. The nature of the here and now for you, how you live your life every day in Christ, that's what you should be focused on. Now, that's not unlike what he just got finished talking to us about in the first half of this chapter also. But I'm going to suggest to you that that's where he's at. So where does that attitude come from? Well, this letter well predates the Gospels, but anachronistically, I'm going to go back to the Gospels. Because though it predates what he had to say to the Thessalonians, it does not predate you and I. You and I have been given the Gospels now. So I'm going to ask you to go to John 14 with me. Now, and, and please do, because we're going to, if you've got your scripture, because we're, we're, we're going to spend the bulk of the rest of our time here. And uh, what, what time are we supposed to get out of here? It's, it's 11 o'clock. Okay, we, we have 25 minutes. We're good. Okay. Okay, so Jesus begins, verse 1, chapter 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. Now, what he's, it, 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 right out of the shoot with that verse, and again, we don't, we don't want to hinge too much on chapter verse, but what he's saying is don't let your hearts be troubled. That should tell you something about what he sees in them that he's saying don't be troubled. And now, so why would he say that? It's fixed. Huh? It's already done. Oh, or, uh, convers yeah, yeah, good, but conversationally. They were looking forward to the uh, death. They were troubled. There you go. They're troubled. They're troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled. 
You know, and you, 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 your child, you know, uh, falls down, you know, and starts crying. You, you say, it's okay. You know, we'll take care. Don't cry. Don't cry. You're saying don't cry because they're already crying. You say, don't, you know, your, 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 your daughter gets jilted by her boyfriend for the first time when she's 13 years old. And it's okay. This isn't the end of the world. This is just, just this is the beginning of a, of a great, yeah. He said, don't let your hearts be troubled because their hearts are troubled. Now he says, don't let your hearts be troubled because he knows their hearts are troubled and their hearts are troubled are, are, is the, the, uh, the, the, the um, context that they are in. What's the context they are in? And this is, this is hopefully uh, a valuable link to us. They're in the upper room. They've just completed the Seder, the Passover meal. Jesus has, has just presided over the last Passover. We know that he at least presided over three Passovers, at least. But maybe more than that, but at least three. This is the last Passover that he would preside over. And so what has happened here is they have gone through the Passover meal. It is a worship. Has anybody done a Seder in here before? Yeah, a, a few. Yeah. yeah, It is a worship celebration in the form of a meal. And it's done with your family. And the father of the family leads this. And it is a history. And it is a nature of our being. And to a little bit a glance into our unknown future. And so each of the elements have now been taken in the Passover meal. And the Passover meal has now come to a close. And this is where I want you to put your imagination sandals on here and go with me into that upper room. The meal is now finished. Now for every one of us who sat at that meal with Jesus, um, we're expecting the conclusion. We've done this many times. We sat at our Father's Passover table. We're now sitting at this Passover where Jesus is leading. It's, this is not new news, and it's not supposed to be new news. Every year, to tell the tell has to happen, to remind us, to re-anchor us every year. And so Jesus has finished this, and we're all ready to be finished. But Jesus isn't finished yet. Jesus grabs a basin takes off his outer garment, ties a towel around his waist, and he washes their feet. And he says, as I've done for you, I want you to do likewise. Well, if that's the case, Jesus, then do all of me, as Peter said. No, 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 no you, you're, you're, you're not getting it. This is a, I, I want, I, I'm sending you out as a servant. So that's the first thing I'm gonna tell you after this Passover meal is complete. Then Jesus is going to take the afikoman. If you know what the afikoman is, the afikoman is a piece of matzah that is put between three folds of fabric, placed that the father does. He places that in front of him, places the afikoman between there, breaks it into two pieces, and sets it aside. And some traditions, we break this and we don't know why. In some traditions, in Jewish uh, uh, Seder, the, the, the person who leads the Seder will say, and we break this, and we don't know why, but he sets it aside. So Jesus now grabs that piece of bread, the afikoman, and he pulls it back out, and he says, take this. This is my body broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And so... Each of the disciples do as he said. And then he takes the wine and he pours it out. In some traditions, it is thought that he took the Elijah cup. The Elijah cup is the cup that was set for the place sitting that nobody touches. Because Elijah is the herald of the Messiah. And at the end of the Seder, Seder meal, before everything's done, the youngest member of the table is called upon by the father to go to the door and call for Elijah. He'll go to the door, he'll open the door, he'll call for Elijah. Elijah doesn't come, he closes the door, he goes back to his father and he says, Elijah has not come. And this is the closure of the meal when, when the father raises his cup and says next year in Jerusalem, expecting the Messiah to come. This is what the Seder meal is about. This is where we've been, this is where we are, this is what we're expecting, the coming of the Messiah. But the Messiah didn't come this year. But Jesus takes a cup Many believe it was the Elijah cup, the cup that is never touched, which would have shocked all of us. 
And he takes that and he, and, he, and he pours wine into that. And he says, take this and drink this. This is my blood shed for you. Now the Seder meal, remember the Seder meal is done. This is like, this is like the credits after the film. This is, this is where all of this came from. How did you get to, to what we just saw? Well, this is it. This is the fulfillment of that in fact, he, he whose body was broken for you, he whose blood was shed for you, is standing before you. And in this, do this in remembrance of me. <clears throat> so they're puzzled. Remember, we're, we're disciples. We've not been through this before. This is, this is new news to us. They're puzzled. And Jesus then says, My children... I will be with you only a little while longer. You'll look for me, just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I'm going, you cannot come. And this new command I give you to love one another, as I have loved you, so that you will love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. It's that new command. Remember, the Passover meal is done. The, what we call communion, the, 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 the sacred elements of the body and the bread have now been sanctified, set apart as a memoriam unto him, even before his body is broken and his blood is shed. And he says, now, I'm, I'm preparing you to be a servant, and now I'm saying, I want you to love each other. Never give up, never forsake a love for each other. Now, they didn't clue in on that. They just clued in on that I, I'm going. And so Simon Peter says, well, where, 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 where are you going? Jesus says, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Well, if you're Peter and you're hearing that the guy whom you had every expectation was to rise to kingship, cast Rome out, restore, is, restore the kingdom, which we've talked about uh, just, just recently in here, restore the kingdom, this is the last time in the world that you would go. This is the time when then the, the culmination of everything that we had hoped and dreamed for rises to the coronation of the king. And you're talking about going. Peter says, why can't I follow you? I'll lay down my life for you. Peter's saying, you don't have, it, it, since you're so afraid and you want to go, you don't have to be afraid because I'll lay down my life for you. I'll do this. I'm, I'm right here with you. Bring the kingdom. Don't go. Bring the kingdom. That's what we're, we're here for. Jesus says, will you? Will you really lay down your life for me? This is, this is one of those questions that Jesus, where, where you, you really get that you don't even know what you're saying, Peter. Yeah, you are going to lay down your life for me, but it's not what you're thinking. Peter will actually exhibit what he's thinking when he's in the garden and he cuts the ear of Malchus off when he thinks he can pull a sword to fight the battle of the spirit, but we won't go there right now. So this is where then Jesus says, guys, your hearts are so troubled. Don't be. Just really briefly, don't be like those heathen who have no hope. Don't be troubled, guys. <clears throat> and this is where we want to continue to focus. Trust in God and trust also in me and my Father's house. There are many rooms, and if it were not so, I would not have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and I will take you with me so that you may be where I am. And you know the way to the place where I am going. And so this, this idea, this, this soul's conviction that we have that Paul's writing the Thessalonians, don't be like the heathens. This is our conviction. This is where it's coming from. Now again, the Gospel of John was written well after the letter to the Thessalonians, but Paul divinely knows this. this the events, these words, were actually transpired before Paul writes these letters. It's just the recording of these words in the Gospel of John uh, post-dates his letter. So Paul has exposure to this knowledge. Paul has the Holy Spirit that indwells him, that confirms this knowledge in him. And he's talking to a young church that says, as you grow in the Spirit, know that this is true. We want to, a, 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 a colleague that I worked with a long time ago was, was instantaneously fascinated by the, um, uh, the uh, uh, Enlightenment philosopher John Locke. John Locke? 
I think Locke, his last name's Locke. And he's known for a lot of things that are really good, but he's also, uh, in, in epist his, his interest in epistemology was that you can't know anything. Everything is just a belief. There's, there's no such thing as true knowledge. There's no unalterable truth. You can only believe whatever you believe now. He's, if you're asking questions about belief, this is, the, you know, reading Locke was, was to, to some degree formative for me to be able to say that if you live by belief, you live, in this, if you, you live morelessly. You'll always be willing to change your belief when the next best answer comes along. But if you live by conviction, then you're unalterable. Well, that didn't have any place in Locke's life. Locke didn't, didn't believe there was anything that wasn't contingent upon something else. And so n knowledge was, was reduced to just belief. Paul is, Paul is saying, you know, you can, th this, is, this is conviction. This is true. This is, this is yet to unfold, but will unquestionably unfold. When Jesus says that when I come back, I'll take you with me so that you may be where I am. You will know the way, the place where I'm going. Thomas kicks in and he says, I, you know, I, I got my maps. You know, I know how to get from here to Bethany because I know the way and I know where I'm going. But I don't, you haven't even told us where you're going. So how in the world, if I don't even know where your destination is, do I know the way? I can't, I can't get there if I don't know where there is. Jesus answered, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's very clear that the way you're thinking, Thomas, you're right. You don't know the way. Because the way is not found on a map. The destination is not found on a map. The way is me. Walk in the way. Followers of the way were what the earliest Christians were called before in Antioch. They were given the title Christians or little Christs. They were all referred to as followers of the way. They get what goes right over our heads a lot of time and that, that Christ is the way. The way of Christ is the way of eternal life. It's what, what uh, what Linda kind of pulled out of the rich young ruler last week for us. That way that you want to walk to attain eternal life is the way of Christ. Walk as Christ did. If you really knew me, you would know my father as well. From now on, you do know him because you have, uh, um, you know him and have seen him. And then Philip kicks in. Really? I mean, Okay, maybe I, I didn't catch that whole Philip thing in the way, but I do get this one. Lord, just show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. This is Philip's response to, if you really knew me, you would know my Father. Philip's saying, just show us the Father. In a roundabout way is Philip saying, maybe I really don't know you. If you're telling me that if I know you, I know the Father, and I'm still asking questions about the Father. The inverse is, is that maybe I really don't know you. And so maybe that's my key to going back to um, uh, 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 Thomas's question about the way. And your answer to Thomas that the way is you. And if I know you, then I know the Father. And then Jesus says, Thomas, Thomas, come. Uh, um, uh, do, 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 or, or Philip, don't you know me, Philip? After I have been with you for so long, such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? This is great. This is Jesus talking. How can you possibly say, show us the Father, when I'm standing right in front of you? What part of this don't you, aren't you, aren't you grasping? Now, I'm not saying that Jesus is angry and frustrated with him. I'm just saying that he's drilling home this, this answer to the question that's in their head is, is who is the Father? And for all of those people that you will run into that will say, you know, the Bible thing's okay, but, but Jesus is not the Son of God. And besides, Jesus never claimed to be God anyhow. That, is, that, is, that, that just shows an, uh, an ignorance of the Word of God by those who attempt to handle the Word of God. They, they're saying that because they don't know. And they don't know because they've not read. And they've done, they don't know more so because they do not possess the Spirit. And this is what Jesus is saying. is the Spirit that lives in you is what reveals this to you. 
If you see me in fire, how can you say, uh, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I and the Father are one and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not my own, but rather the Father's living in me who is doing his work. Believe in what I say, that I am the Father and the Father is in, I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. Now that was kind of a struggle for me because I really wanted to, I want to be able to get past the miracles and say, yeah, the miracles pointed to you as the Son of God. The, 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 the creator of the universe that can, can manage the universe in any way you choose, and you demonstrate that through the miracles. But I want to say, I don't have to have the miracles. I believe you. Because the, the Spirit has con, uh, convicted me of that. So whether or not there's miracles, I really want to subordinate the issue of miracles. This is me personally. I want to subordinate the issue of miracles in my life to a great degree. And, and I, I hate to say it this way, but I'm going to say it this way anyhow. I don't care if I never, ever, ever see a miracle that will never change the conviction in my life that Jesus is who he says he is. And if I see a miracle, that's great. And I'm not saying that I haven't seen miracles. Honestly, every time we see a new believer come into the salvation of Christ, we have seen a dead man raised unto life. We have seen a miracle. We may not have recognized it for what it is, but we have seen a miracle. But I don't have to have that personally that my conviction lies upon the, the spirit that has made it clear to me that Christ is who he says he is. So when Jesus says, if you don't believe, believe upon the miracle, that's a bridge. The miracles are not the end. They're a pointer to him. Oh, gosh. Um, I tell you the truth. Anyone who is in faith in me will do what I've been doing. He will be even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Now, I'm just going to read briskly here. Gail's waved her phone at me already. And I will do whatever you ask in my name. The Son may bring glory to the Father. You ask me anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, you will obey what I command. This is back to 1 John. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you a, uh, another, the Counselor, who will be with you forever in the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because they never see him, neither see him or know him. But you know him, for he lives in you, and he will be with you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come unto you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. And this is why I'm bringing all of John into this morning. Because I live, you will also live. Because I live, you will also live. Remember where we're at. We're still in the upper room. The Seder is done. The feet are washed. The, the communion that we're in, the, the culmination of Passover has now revealed the person of Christ as the Messiah. Your hearts are troubled. Don't be troubled. Know everything that I've told you, but here's where I want to draw you. Because I live, you will also live. Now, they don't know the crucifixion is coming. For them, things are about to change really, really briskly. Remember when we are. When are we? We are Thursday night. We are Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the resurrection. That's where we are. Things are going to change very rapidly, very drastically, that will look nothing like a king ascending to his throne and re throwing um, Rome out and 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 re uh, reestablishing the kingdom as all of us are looking for we're all at the table this is what we're all thinking we're all puzzled by many of the things that Jesus is saying but now he comes to say because I live you will also live now if there's something I put in my back pocket I've, I've heard a lot maybe I understand some maybe I don't understand some but that one seems pretty important to me and it's going to be real value to valuable to me on Sunday because I live, you shall also live. When Paul writes the Thessalonians and says, we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's, uh, the Lord's own words, we tell you uh, who are still alive, who are left will be coming with the Lord, who certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. This is what he's saying. He arose in the flesh. He ascended to the right hand of the Father. He's coming again for his church. He's coming again for the redeemed. The dead will rise first. Those who are living will, will come thereafter and will rise. And rise is important because where do we rise unto? 
I'm sorry? Rise in Christ. Yeah, we arise in Christ, but uh, I'm, 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 I'm looking for something in the Cartesian plane here. Uh, the clouds, the clouds. Now, this too, this is, th- remember, the writing of this predates the writing of the gospel, but does not predate the, the reciting of the words. Are you the son of God? Yeah, I am. And I'm your judge, and I'm coming back. Now, how did Jesus say I'm coming back? You shall see the son of man coming on the clouds. He even gives us that definition at the end of Acts, or at the, I'm sorry, the beginning of Acts. That as with the angel, why do you why do you stand here looking up? He's coming back in the same way that you saw him go. The ascension that you see him arise into the clouds. That's that is how he's coming back. What Paul's saying when you yeah when you rise you're going to rise in the clouds. Okay, so Gail's waving at me. I I, I got I got to wrap here. So I want to say this 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 kind of one little thing. In some of uh, in some disciplines we will see the picture of the cross and Christ on the cross. In others, you will see as it is, is depicted in our sanctuary, it's the cross, but Christ is not on the cross. Neither of those are what the ancients put on the altar. What the ancients put on the altar was the resurrection of Christ. That's what you saw. It's not, it's not even the empty tomb. But the depiction that the ancients put central above the altar was the resurrection of Christ. That's because the ancients understood the great hope that everything that we believe hinges upon. Because he lives, I shall also live. When Paul is talking to the Thessalonians, he says, don't be like the heathens. They don't, they don't have any idea. They don't know anything about what it means when Jesus arose from the dead and will gather us those who are asleep in Christ first, those who are alive in Christ second, live your lives every day prepared for this because as he ascended, you will also ascend and you will know the new body, the new life, the fulfilled life to be restored unto the garden, the place for which you were created eternally with him. Don't be like the I, I, I get to the point that sometimes in, when I'm at funerals to think that the tears are more of an expression of vanity than anything else. They represent my loss than, than my joy for those who have gone on before me. And, I, and I, 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 even though I've cried at funerals before, I, I have to just think back and say, well, that's, that's more of an expression of vanity than it is any kind of sympathy. So we got to close this morning. Other thoughts before we close this morning? I, I read about it I did not take the time this morning to, to read, but if, if you're willing to read a short poem, it is from James Weldon uh, Johnson from 1871 called Go Down Death. Now, there's a better way to get this poem if you'll go on YouTube and type in Whitney Phipps, Go Down Death, which is an extraordinary reciting of this poem. But just reading it slowly, hearing the words of this sermon in a poem is extraordinary. Uh, and so I, I would counsel you, go read Go Down Death, but go to YouTube and listen to Whitney Phipps orate this. You know it, you know it, yeah, just extraordinary, just extraordinary. Go Down Death has this whole thing encapsulated into a very short package that clarifies the hope Paul's talking about. Whitley sounds like the voice of authority. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's an extraordinary voice. His, his voice is extraordinary. Um, but Whitney Phipps, or Whitley Phipps, Whitley Phipps. Uh, we got we to gotta close. Um, uh, Dennis, can you close us in prayer this morning, sir? Amen.